We have been in the book of Ephesians for 17 weeks. We're in, we're in week number 18. Here we are. And um, we are now in the last two chapters of Ephesians. Uh, we're beginning chapter 5 today. And um, I am really looking forward to this. Like I am super pumped about what God is going to do. In two weeks, I'll just let you know, um, I'm not one of those pastors that like tries to hide when I'm going to be out of town. So in two weeks, I'm going to be out of town. I'm excited about this. Uh, Tim Currington, who leads our worship, is going to be preaching um, in two weeks. Um, and we're, we're talking right now. Uh, you're going to get exactly word-for-word word Bible. Um, he's going to stay in what we're talking about and be right in the book of Ephesians. And so we're going to keep rolling right through. And here's the reason I said that. Every single sermon from now until the time we're done with Ephesians is filled with practical application. It is filled with, this is what you do in order to live and breathe and function as a Christian. And so a lot of people say, oh, you know, the pastor gets up there and yeah, he talks a good game and he gets you real pumped up and he talks about everything. He's like, praise the Lord, praise God. God's going to get you through the trials. God's going to get you through all the bad times. I'm like, hey, hey, hoorah, hoorah. But at the end of the day, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean for me Tuesday? What does that mean for me Thursday afternoon when I get home from work and I've had a bad day and my kids are mouthing off and, you know, I don't want to discipline them in anger, but... So this is practical stuff. So anybody that says, hey, make sure you're practical. Ephesians is practical. And I I, I don't want you to miss, if you possibly can can make this, don't miss between now and the time we get done with Ephesians. You say, Josh, how many weeks is that? You'll find out. And so will I. All right. So we're going to, we're not skipping anything. We're walking through it. Our series has been entitled In Christ. In Christ. And let me say this. We are now into the practical elements of the book of Ephesians, but we took probably 12 weeks to 13 weeks in our first three chapters where we laid theological doctrinal truths out about who we are in Christ. And now it is how we are to behave or to act in Christ. Today's sermon title is simple, like father, like son. Like father, like son just so that I'm not discriminatory, like mother, like daughter, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. If you've been married or you've been in a serious relationship with people before and you've met their family and you've gotten to know their family, there are times in your relationship, I'm sure it none happens to none of y'all, it's just my, Sarah's relationship, uh, but there are times where something might come out of your mouth and it may say something like, You sound just like your mother. Don't don't say that as often as you can. Just stop. But that is just like your dad. And I will say this. My dad uh, is 75 years old. But to this day, there are things that my dad does that I do. And I really can't explain why I do them or why that's the way I do them. There's one thing that I do that I have actually passed down to my oldest daughter, poor thing. And it's this, it's kind of weird. I gotta put a microphone down to do it. It's this, I don't even think about it. I like rub my hands together. When I'm excited or anything, like when I'm talking, I like rub my hands. And my dad, that is my father. And my poor daughter, my poor little daughter has started doing that. And so how many of you understand we don't really even understand or figure out, or we don't, we're not consciously doing it. But have you understand, there are things that your father or your mother, and it's not just gender specific, there are things I do that's my mother. How many of you understand that? How many of you say, in my life, I know there are things I do, and it's just, it's just hereditary. Anybody? And how about this? I know every hand is going up. How about your significant other? There's things in their life that I know is hereditary. So, okay, my wife's hand's up. All right, good. Good. At the end of the day... We are, and we do, we are basically the sum total of our influences. Think about that statement. We are the sum total of our influences. And there are many different avenues by which we are influenced, but we are who we are today because of those who have influenced our lives. 
And it just so happens that for many of us, and I understand that there may be some difficult home situations and you may not have grown up with, with your real father or your real mother or both or whatever the situation may be. However, if you did, there is nothing more powerful than the influence of a parent, of a parent. And so today we're going to talk about the, the influence of a father. Look at verse 1 in Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, look along in your Bible. If you don't, follow along on the screen. We have it there for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God. Some of your Bibles may say followers. Um, I, really, I like both of those words. I think they, if put together, be imitating followers. That's exactly the truth that is trying to be uh, presented in this passage. Be, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator or unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. This entire portion of Scripture, all the way down to verse 21, kind of breaks apart a three-part Instruction. We're going to talk about how to walk. We're going to see verse 2 says, and walk in love. And then we talk about some things today. Verse number um, 8 says this, walk in the light. Uh, verse number 15 says, walk circumspectly or walk uh, with wisdom. And we're going to talk over the next few Sundays or next couple of weeks about this. Like father, like son. Be ye imitators of God as children. Heavenly Father, speak through your word today. And God, I pray that, you, that, that I would be removed from this equation, God, that your, uh, your, your truth from your word would shine through. And this morning, we would truly imitate you. God, an impossible task, but a worthy task. An impossible task, but a task that you have called us to. And God, I pray that we would leave here today imitators of God. Imitators of God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I jump into the po first point this morning, I want us to see something that I believe is very important. The very first verse, verse number one. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. You see, I can already begin to formulate my, my excuse. I'm already set in my ways. You know how long I've been on this earth? This is just the way I am. I'm sorry, but I can already formulate all of our excuses. So let's get this out of the way. If we are going to imitate God, we must do so as a child. And a child is extremely impressionable and a dear ch dear children are very moldable and i can get i can convince my eight-year-old girl to do anything i tell her to do give me time and i will get her to imitate me why because she's a child she's a child but I, I think as we all understand as we grow up we no longer are as dear children. We are as hard-headed adults. We are as rebellious teenagers. But teenagers, I'm not picking on you. We are as rebellious adults. Because just because you turn 20 doesn't mean you stop being rebellious. Now you're just a rebellious adult. Hey. 
That's what we, so let's get this out of the way. If we are going to imitate, follow, if we are going to, to, to put into practice what we're going to talk about from God's word today, we have to make ourselves as dear children. And we have to remove all of those excuses and we have to remove everything out of our minds and our hearts where we say, oh, I'm already this way and I'm just wired this way and I've been this way my whole life and so whatever. No, we have to put that aside. So before we even talk, can we put that aside and realize if we're going to come to Christ, if we're going to, if we're going to walk as an imitator of God, we're going to have to do that just like we came to him. And the Bible says if we're going to come to Christ, we must come as a little child. And if we're going to follow him and imitate him, we have to follow and imitate him as a, as a child. Childlike faith. And so this morning, let's, let's remove all of our excuses and let's look at what the Bible says as we imitate like father, like son. Number one, let's see, very simply, we are to walk in love. We are to walk in love. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, verse 1, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Notice that the very first thing that Paul tells us to do is to walk in love, and that is consistent with the teachings of Jesus. You see, Jesus was asked, hey, what's most important? What's the first thing? In fact, I believe the way that it was worded as teacher, Matthew 22, verse 36, which is the great commandment in the law? What's the greatest commandment? Hey, what's primary? What's number one? If we're going to follow you, if we're going to obey you, if we're going to imitate you, hey, what's number one? And what does Jesus say in his own words? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, love always has been and always will be the foundational truth behind who we are as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, if your foundation and your following Jesus is based upon anything else, then it is a false foundation. It must be based upon love. In fact, I will say it this way. You cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus and live a life based upon anything other than love. You cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus and live your life based upon any other foundation, based upon any other starting point, based upon any other green flag than love. We must begin at love. Love. Having love, biblical, godly love. Love for one another. Do we know God? Do we want to imitate God? Do we want to follow God? But let me ask you this. How's our love life? With Christians, church. How's our love displayed one for another? Hey, how's our love for that broken Coworker, how's that love for that for that person that you deal with in your family that's very difficult to deal with? How's your love? Hey, we're real good at everything else. How's your condemnation? Ten out of ten. How's your judgmental? Ten out of ten. How's your cynicism? Uh, eight out of ten, but I'm working on it, trying to get it to ten out of ten. Hey, how's your criticism? Ten. Hey, how's your love? How's your love? How's your love? One for another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you stand firm on all the nitty-gritty doctrines of the New Testament. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you vote in accordance to what I believe you ought to vote. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if I lead a campaign of of righteousness politically. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if I give of my money to the church. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if I faithfully attend every church service and every connect group because I feel guilt. No. By the way, if you're new to church, all that was false. Please don't. (laughs) Sorry. No, by this 
shall all men know that you are my disciples. What is it? Do you know? If you have love one for another. Hey, if you're going to walk as an imitator of God, you've got to love people. You've got to love people. And, and, And this isn't a psychology message this morning. But let me just say this, if you're going to love someone, true love is giving without expecting anything in return. Hey, true love is, I offer this, you can have it. True love says, I offer myself to you, and I trust you so much that you can walk all over me, because I love you. You have my heart, and you can take my heart, and you can wring my heart out if you want to, or you can love me back. I love you no matter what. Love. How can we imitate God more? What, is, what does Scripture say? I, I believe I have it here. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love is directly from God. If we're going to imitate God, love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God. God. That's the Bible. That ain't me. So don't get mad at me. Talk to God. If you got a complaint, hit him up. All right? He will listen. I'm not going to listen to your complaint about that because I didn't say it. The Bible says it. God said it through the Holy Spirit empowering John to write 1 John. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. Every time I read this verse, I ask for my math people. How many of you are math people out here? All right, come on. There we go. There's like three of you. That's good. If you're a math person, what does that word is mean? That word equals. God equals love. God equals love. And if we're going to imitate God, we will imitate him no better than when we love. When we love. And this morning, uh, you're going to leave this service and you're going to go somewhere this afternoon and you're going to have an opportunity to love, whether it be your immediate family members, whether it be people in your neighborhood, maybe your neighborhood, you see a lot of people are out and you're able to interact. You're going to have an opportunity to love. And tomorrow you're going to go to work and tomorrow you're going to have an opportunity to love. Maybe you work in education. You're going to have an opportunity to love the youngest and the least of these. Maybe you work in white collar society and you have a lot of people around you that are that are uppity and you have a lot you're gonna have an opportunity to love hey maybe you got a good boss or maybe you got a jerk for a boss you have an opportunity to love hey maybe you have co-workers who work hard and pull their weight and you guys have a great team you're gonna have an opportunity to love maybe you work tomorrow and you work with a bunch of lazy people who just get by and you're left to pull all, all the weight you have an opportunity to love to love if we're going to walk in as imitators of God, we must walk in love. You say, that sounds like an, an, an impossible task. And in a way it is. But here's what I like. Verse 2 says, walk in love. And how are we to do that? What's our, oh, as Christ also has loved us. And given himself for us. Hey, what does love look like? That's what Christ did on the cross. 2,000 years ago, he came and he died. And by the way, let me just say this. We're not in an invitation this morning. If you've never accepted the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus that he would give himself for God, so loved the world that he gave. That's what love looks like. It looks like giving. But Jesus Christ gave his life. And all of us were born sinners. And he gave his life on Calvary's cross. And he died on a cross. And he took upon him your sin. And he took my sin. And he he died in your place and in my place. That's love. That is love. He gave. And this morning, if you have never accepted the fact that Jesus in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you've never accepted, and leave that up there for a little bit, if you've never accepted that verse right there, then this morning needs to be the day that you accept the love of Christ because you're never going to live in true love until you've experienced the love of Christ. 
Hey, the love of Christ has nothing to do with where you go to church, has nothing to do with what kind of church you grew up in, has nothing to do with how, how well you pray, has nothing to do with how much money you give to that church, it has nothing to do with how much uh, talking you do to the pastor, now, it has nothing, to do with, has nothing to do with anything except for what was done. And that's while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm not here this morning to get technical on you, but Jesus, we've learned this if you've been in our church since the beginning, that God lives in no time. And Jesus is God, and Jesus lives in no time. It is as if when he died on that cross and he stretched out his arms and those, those nails were put into his hands, it's as if he looked down. It says, while you were still sinners, you, 2,000 years ago, you, 2018 now, still sinners. It's as if he was watching all of mankind. And seeing all of our sin. And 1 Corinthians says, taking all that sin upon himself and becoming our sin. And he was looking down. While you're still sinners, I'm going to die for your sin. What love? What love can we walk in that love? If you've never accepted that love at the end of the service today, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. You will never walk in love until you've accepted the greatest gift of love, and that's Jesus Christ. Are you, are you walking in love? But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Look at, secondly this morning, walk in love, number one. Secondly this morning, walk in holiness. I love the last song we sang. By the way, that song has been out for, it's approaching 10 years now that that song has been out. And it somehow slipped through. It came out on an album and it slipped through and never really became popular. And I'm not sure why. But it was popular to me. And uh, I love that song. You are holy. God most high and God most worthy. Walk in holiness. Look at verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, and this is my, not my words, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If we are going to be true imitators and followers of God, we must walk in holiness. We must live holy lives. You say, what does that mean? Holiness defined as simply this, it's purity or integrity of moral character. It is freedom from sin, and it is to be set apart or made unique. Purity or integrity of moral character, freedom from sin, and to be set apart or made unique. Charles Spurgeon said, it, this, said this about holiness. Unless our faith makes us pine after holiness, it is no better than the faith of devils. And perhaps it is not even so good as that. A holy man is the workmanship of the Holy Spirit. Read that quote, let it sink in. You know, the devils, they believe, they tremble. They know there's a God. They, they war with him every day. But unless our faith makes us pine after holiness, it is no better than the faith of devils, and perhaps it is not even so good as that. A holy man is the workmanship of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen this morning, boys and girls this morning, teenagers this morning, uh, people that in your 50s this morning, people in your 20s this morning, people in your teens this morning, we have been called to walk in holiness we have been called to live holy separated set apart free from sin lives that's what we have been called to do we are to reject fornication and all other forms of unclean living in fact not even let it be said about us not even to be said about us that we commit these sins or live in these lifestyles we are to be holy, God says, for I am holy. I was on a little Spurgeon kick while I was 
studying for this, Spurgeon also said this about holiness. And by the way, between Charles Spurgeon and Martin Lloyd-Jones, those are two really good people to read after on holiness. Spurgeon also says this, I would sooner be holy than happy if the two things could be divorced. Were it possible for a man always to sorrow and yet be pure, I would choose to sorrow if I might win the purity. For to be free from the power of sin, to be made to love holiness, is true happiness. That's got to stay up for a second because that's a lot. Spurgeon's kind of deep. So just let him, let that marinate for a little bit. Y'all are hungry, I know. Let it marinate. Just like that steak sauce, right? Let it marinate. I would sooner be holy than happy if the two could be divorced. If I could pick one or the other, I'd rather be holy. Were it possible for a man to always sorrow, so to not be happy, yet to be pure, to be holy, I would choose being sorrowful if I might be holy. For to be free from the power of sin and to be made to love holiness is true happiness. That's, there's a lot there. If you need to snap a picture, it's all good. We'll, pro- we'll, we'll, we'll put that out today. That'll come out on social media. You'll be good. If you follow us. If you don't follow us, brief commercial. At Keystone RDU. All right. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. To be saved? No. Actually, it says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So let me give you my biblical definition of what I believe holiness is. Holiness is to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of Jesus. That is holiness. Hey, we're to walk in love, but we're to walk in holiness. Hey, that means we're going to be different than the world. Hey, that means we're not going to participate in the same things as the world. And this is not a moralistic sermon again. But this is just, let's just be for real. That means we're going to have a different view of, of, of fornication than the world has. That means we're going to have a different view of maybe sexuality than the world has. That means we're going to have a, a different view of the truth maybe than the world has. We're going to live holy lives based upon this book right here. This is what's going to govern and, and guide us. Rightly dividing the word of God. We're going to walk in holiness. We're going to raise our children to walk and live holy lives. When, when they go off to school and, and they're around a lot of people maybe that are unbelievers, there's going to be, there should be something, something different because we live in holiness. Holiness. And holiness is not just what we don't do. Holiness is a lot of what we do. We're not separated from, but we're also, we're not just separated from, we're separated unto good works. We're, we're separated to walk with Christ, to walk as imitators of God. We have been ordained, we have been called to live holy lives. And that means if we're going to live in holiness this morning, we're going to have to repent and reject our lifestyles that do not reflect holiness. And that is a wide range this morning. It's not my job this morning to tell you every area of your life that that I think is unholy. No, that's the Holy Spirit's job. He does a really good job of that. He will speak to you. He will lead you. He will guide you if you listen and you will let him. But I will say this. There's probably some things in our lives that in order to live a holy life, we probably need to get rid of. However, there's some things in our lives, as we learned last week, the replacement principle. If we're going to live holy lives, those things that we, we can't just get rid of, we must replace with. See, we get rid of, but then we replace it with. Hey, we get rid of the wrong influences, those that are influencing us in an unholy way. And we replace them with godly influences, people that will push us toward holiness. Hey, we, we repent and we replace. We repent and And we replace. And this morning I'm calling you and I'm calling me and I'm calling our church to repent of unholiness and to respond, to seek after, to follow holiness. Holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. 
we're to walk in love, if we're going to be imitators of God, if we're going to walk as godly men and women, if we're going to be holy, we must walk in love. Hey, listen, and don't take this the wrong way. If we are to be known for one of the other, and, and this is not, this is a false dichotomy, but however, if you say you have to be known for either love or holiness, I would rather be known for love. I believe it's the greatest commandment. I believe scripture teaches that multiple times over and over. I would rather be known for love than holiness. However, I believe if we're truly going to be imitators of God, if we're going to look like little gods, little Jesuses running around, right, by the way, that's what they called them, Christians, little Christs running around. If that's what we're going to be, imitators of God, we must both walk in love and holiness. But let me warn you, if you focus this morning simply on walking in holiness and you neglect to focus on walking in love, welcome to the life of an unhappy, legalistic, judgmental Christian. Welcome to many churches across this world who, man, they got the holiness right. Brother, we are holy. And that's, you know, their socks, everything. Holy. God, there's religious socks on. We are holy. But love? Here's another one. This is, this is, these are great. By the way, next week fits right in, so don't miss it. Number three this morning, walk in love, number one. And number two, walk in holiness. But number three, walk in discernment. Walk in discernment. Look at verse seven. He gives a warning. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. This is the end, and I promise you it's the end. If you could see my notes, you would see that. But an entire book of the Bible has been given to us to help us in the area of discernment. We have the entire book of Proverbs that the main thrust of the book of Proverbs is to walk as wise men or women walk and to not walk as the foolish or the simple. It's the entire book of Proverbs. In fact, in the next couple of days, I'm going to start a Bible reading um, through YouVersion app, reading through the book of Proverbs. And it's going to talk about wisdom, and it's going to talk about the foolish and the simple and all the different uh, character traits in the book of Proverbs. And I'll make sure I send that out to you if you'd like to join me. But we must walk in discernment. You see, those that are walking and following and imitating God are walking in love. They're walking in holiness. But they're also walking with a discerning eye, a discerning ear, in wisdom. In wisdom. You see, wisdom tells you when to act upon the Holy Spirit's leading. You see, wisdom says, hold on just a minute. Hey, before you dive into that, hold on just a second. Hey, wisdom says, hey, before you do that, you might want to run that past your spouse. Hey, wisdom says, hold on, you know what? Before I do that, let me, let me just take a little bit of time. Hold on. Wisdom also says, hey, you better act now because this is the moment that I've given you to, to do this to show love, and you need to act right now. That's wisdom. You see, wisdom can tell you to wait, or wisdom can tell you to, you better do it now. Wisdom says, can we just be real where we're at? Wisdom says you pull up to that same intersection and that same homeless person is holding that same sign, and wisdom tells you to act upon it or to not act upon it. Can we, let's be real. Wisdom says when... Your friend at work says, hey, I need some help. Wisdom says, hold on just a second. And if I just give this cash money, you know what? There's been some signs. Maybe I need to ask my boss. Hey, do you think, maybe my boss knows about a substance abuse issue in their life that I don't know about. Wisdom says, hold on just a second. Hey, wisdom says that when the guy at the gas station is saying, hey, I need some money for gas. Do you have any cash? You know what wisdom says? Let me take out my card and let me put some gas in your car. 
Because if you need gas, I'd love to give it to you. That's just wisdom. It's not being judgmental. Please don't confuse the two. It's just discernment. You see, if we're going to walk as imitators of God, the all-wise, the omniscient, the all-knowing, if we're going to walk as wise, we will walk with discernment. And I wish I would never do this, but I wish that I could give you illustrations within our church um, in the last six months. I would say five different times. There have been situations within our church where I have seen our people walk in discernment. And it's been amazing. Both positively, and then I've also seen some where they've had to take a step back or they've been, hold on just a second, but it's walking in discernment. Hey, listen, if any of you lack wisdom, James, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. Hey, we need discernment. If we're going to walk as an imitator of God, we must walk in discernment, not walk as fools, not to walk as the simple ones, but to walk in discernment as a wise one. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of weeks. But being imitators of God. There is no higher calling that we have than to walk like father, like son. There's no greater reward than one day standing before our creator God and him saying, like father, like son. There's no greater reward than, I don't know if your dad does the whole, the whole elbow and wink and whatever that is, there would be nothing better than standing before my creator, God, and having him go, that's mine. Like father, like son. There's nothing better than that. The way the scripture words it is, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You see, because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, he has called us to this standard of living. Love, holiness, discernment. we got more coming. That's not it. Keep reading. If you want to read this week, get ready. It's all good. Keep reading this passage. We're called to walk in love, holiness, and discernment. If you are here today, and we talked about it at the beginning, walking in love, and you're like, I'm trying to walk in love, but just not... It may be because you've never experienced love. The true love of Jesus Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you're here today and you have never put your complete faith and your complete trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. For by grace, Ephesians chapter 2, just a couple of chapters before, are you saved? For by grace are you saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And it is not of works, lest any man should boast And y'all know I'm going to say it, because if we could boast, we would. If it was of our works, we would boast. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put your full faith and trust in him, would you let today be that day? We're going to give you a really easy opportunity. In fact, would you do this for me? Would everyone bow their head and close their eyes this morning? As you have your heads bowed and eyes closed, some of our worship team is going to get up and move to the stage, and that's completely fine. Don't worry about that. Other than them moving, everyone is heads bowed and eyes closed, and we have a private moment here. And if you're here this morning and you say, Josh, I've got to be very honest with you. There's never been a time in my life where I have put my full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I do not have a personal relationship with him. I couldn't be honest with you today and say that I do. If that's you this morning, in the privacy of this moment, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and, 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 and do anything. I'm not going to mention your name if I know your name. You may have been, this may be your first time at our church today, or you may have been here since the very first day we opened in October of last year. But if you've never accepted the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, today should be that day. If you're here today, you say, Josh, I've never trusted in Jesus as my Savior. Would you do me a favor and just slip your hand up right beside your head? 
I can take it right back down. I'm not going to embarrass you. Would you lift it up and then just take it right back down this morning? Christian, if you're here today and God spoke to your heart in any way of walking in love or walking in holiness or walking in discernment, maybe this morning we need through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the strength that He gives us, maybe we need to surrender some things this morning. Maybe we need to come forward to this. It's not even an altar here. Maybe you need to stay in your seat and pray. But maybe this morning we need to get rid of some things or we need to commit to adding some biblical things into our lives because we are to be imitators, followers of God, like Father, like Son.